Well, thank you so much for organizing this. Good morning, everybody. <clears throat> it's a great pleasure to be giving this talk to you. My name is Sam Bajati. I am a fellow at Corpus. I am also a cancer researcher. That's sort of what I do most of the week. And for one day a week, I'm a pediatric oncologist at Addenbrooke's Hospital in Cambridge. What um, I would like to talk to you today about is cancer, or specifically cancer genomics, what causes human cancer is the title of the lecture. Um, it's a bit, I mean, obviously it's, it's, uh, it, it is what it is that we're doing this over Zoom and not in person. So it's a bit tricky to make this interactive. So what I would suggest is that I try to talk for about half an hour, and then we use the Q&A for you to throw questions at me. Uh, Okay. Um, yes, so please, as I go along, please write down your questions. I can't actually see you, so if you, if you were to raise your hand or, or wave, I wouldn't see that. So just write down your questions, and then we'll, we'll try to address them at the end. I'll try to go at a reasonably slow pace. Um, Sorry to interrupt you, Sam. I'll moderate for you. So I'll feed questions from the Q&A, so you can just concentrate on giving the answers. Oh, that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Good. So let's start. What causes human cancer? Could you just confirm that you saw my slide change? Yes, all good. Okay, brilliant. So what you see here is a beautiful picture of corpus in the, uh, in, in the middle. Uh, this is the chapel and to the right of the chapel are the, the master's lodgings here in the far right corner. You can see um, our, our library, this is the old library where the medieval manuscripts are kept. So um, I just want to briefly say why you should study in Cambridge, because it is, it is just a wonderful experience and, and an awful lot of fun. And you, you learn a great deal and, and you, will, you would have a thoroughly wonderful time being here. And that's sort of as much as, as I will say about this. So let's talk about cancer. So the one thing that I want to get across to you today is, and this, if you don't take away anything else from this talk, is that cancer is caused by mutations. And therefore, whatever causes mutations is also the cause of cancer. Now, this goes back quite some time. So we are now at the beginning of the 20th century. This is a German, Theodor Bulveri, who, who was a, a professor at the university in South Germany. And he made this quite extraordinary. He studied sea urchins and he looked at sea urchins under the microscope. And what he figured out is, or what he observed is that when sea urchins divide, they, and, and there's something wrong in their chromosomes. So although this is before the discovery of the DNA, because people already had microscopes, they, they sort of knew of chromosomes. They didn't know what they were but they could physically see them. And these sea urchins have got very large cells. So you can, under the microscope, see the nucleus and you can see the, um, you can see chromosomes. And what he observed is that if the chromosome number was different from normal, then the sea urchins wouldn't develop normally. They would develop in abnormal ways. And he concluded from that, that whatever chromosomes are, it, you need a normal number of chromosomes to be able to fully uh, to develop normally. And therefore, by extension, that if you don't develop normally, uh, there is something wrong with your chromosomes. And he specifically thought about cancer because what he saw under the microscope in the sea urchins with abnormal chromosome complements is to him very much looked like cancer. So he came up with this idea. And this is extraordinary. I just want you to reflect upon the fact that this is a chap who had no knowledge of DNA. This is, you know, just a guy with a microscope and sea urchin eggs. He came up with this idea that he thought that the causes of human cancer were something to do with chromosomes and chromosomes not being normal. The, so this is the beginning of the 20th century. So 90, actually just at the, the eve of World War I. So then fast forward, you know, people had all sorts of ideas about what cancer might be. In particular, people thought that cancers were caused by infections. And that's a, a notion that's been quite difficult to get rid of. And now we are in the sort of 1960s and these two chaps here, Nowell and Hungerford, they looked at uh, chromosomes of chronic myeloid leukemia, CML. 
their discovery was brought about the, by the ability to stain chromosomes so you, you can count them, you can literally go, you know, I've got, you know, two ones, two twos, and so forth. So they look at CML chromosomes across many different patients. And what they saw in every single patient is this, that chromosomes nine and 22, the second copy says, you know, we've got two copies of each chromosome. One copy didn't look quite right. And basically it looked a bit like that what was missing from 22 was tagged onto chromosome nine. And this is a Philadelphia chromosome. It was called the Philadelphia chromosome because at that time, all these things were named after the cities where they were discovered and they were at UPenn, hence the Philadelphia chromosome. And they put out the notion that CML is caused by this change in chromosome nine and 22, by this translocation where a bit of 22 is uh, put onto nine. So, and that was true in 100% of cases of CML. People still disputed that notion because what they said is, well, that is, you know, this is a chicken and egg question. And what you're looking at is at the effect, not the cause. And then this lady down here, Rowley, actually sequenced the genetic code that arose at that junction where 22 is tagged onto 90 onto chromosome 9 and discovered that what is happening there is that two kinases, BCR and ABL, are stuck together and make this cancer kinase, BCR ABL, which is the cause of CML. And the significance of that is that, first of all, it's the first um, uh, cancer mutation that has been found. And in this case, the very specific mutations where two genes that shouldn't be together are you know, tacked together. That's one thing. And then the other thing that she found, and that's also very important to, to, to highlight here, is that because it's a kinase, it's an enzyme that does things. It is the first mutation for which a specific drugs had been developed su subsequently over the next few decades. And there's a drug called Glyvec, or, or, which is a, is, a, is a very specific inhibitor of this one mutant kinase. So it'll go in there, it'll just inhibit the mutation and nothing else. And that's sort of holy grail of cancer treatment that one, one would hope to find. Now, people were still disputing whether all of cancer was caused by mutations, people were still quite obsessed with the idea of viruses causing mutations. And this is a definitive experiment that sort of dispelled that myth. This is uh, uh, Robert Weinberg. And the experiment that he did is this. He took a normal cell line and a cancer cell line, and then took the nucleus from a cancer cell and put it into a normal cell. And that experiment transformed the normal cell into a cancer cell. And that definitively proved that whatever causes cancer is contained within the nucleus. And of course, what is contained within the nucleus is DNA. And therefore, it is DNA, the changes in the DNA of the cancer cell that turns the cancer cell into a cancer cell. This is a seminal experiment. After that, there couldn't really be any question anymore about viruses causing cancers. Um, I've put up a quote here from a chap called Bill Becker, and this is before the Human Genome Project was done. And what Bill Becker put out here is this. Um, I won't read through it, I'll just summarize the, the bottom line is this. He said, well, we now know that mutations cause cancer. So what we could now try to do is we could just try to, you know, it's really quite difficult to, you know, that experiment that I showed you with now the Hungerford and, and Rowley, those are people dedicating their entire career to figuring out what mutations. So he said, well, we can do that. We can, you know, each of us spend the rest of their lives trying to find one mutation, or we do this differently. We crack the human genome, uh, the human genetic code. So we figure out what those 3 billion letters are that make up the genetic code of humans. And then we can compare cancer cells to it. And then we'll find the difference without any preconceptions, without any biases. It'll, it'll, we have a reference, once we have the reference map, we can, we can figure out human cancer. So this was really the, one of the many reasons why in the 90s, um, <clears throat> people in the UK and in America engaged in the Human Genome Project to build that reference map. So we've got something we can compare cancer genomes to. So what are mutations? Remember I said mutations is what causes cancer. So let's briefly talk about what mutations are. Mutations are a change compared to the reference sequence of the human genome. So what I'm showing you here is, um, if you start on the left, these are sequencing reads. So these are letters, they're readouts of DNA. 
On the left, you can see all the sweets here at the top are from a tumor. At the bottom, they are from normal tissue from the same patient. And what we do here is we compare the tumor to the normal. So if, if I were to zoom in, you would see letters A, C, T, G, A, C, T, G. And what we, what we see is that when it's yellow and blue, it means it looks like the reference human genome. And red means as a deviation, a mutation. And what you can see is that the tumor in this particular position has got lots of sequence changes. They pile up together into a mutation. So the mutation in this particular tumor is that this particular base has been replaced by a different base. That's what we call a substitution. And here on the far right, if you were to look there, what you can see there is there are two bases missing. That would be deletion. So the genetic code has gone from CCA, um, GGGAA to let's delete two, uh, um, two bases. So mutations can be changes of individual bases. So we replace one base with another or we delete on insert additional bases. The other thing that can happen is that we uh, take large chunks of chromosome and chop and uh, cut and paste them. So the example that I showed you earlier with, with chromosome nine and 22, where that little bit of 22 was tacked onto chromosome nine is a, is a translocation. So there are all these different types of sequence changes and that's, that's what a mutation is. And this is an extreme example. Forget the top one, just look at the bottom. So this is a chromosome 17 in a, in a bone cancer. You can see we go from chromosome uh, position zero to 80 uh, million. So 80 megabases, and then on the y-axis, we get the copy number to tell us how many copies we have. And there should be one flat line, and what you can see is it's got this oscillating pattern. And then uh, these, those arch show all the different rearrangements in this particular chromosome. So this chromosome has been, in this cancer, has been completely shattered by mutations and turned into this, this utter, utter mess of a chromosome, yet it's still stable. And what this does here is, it generates mutations that drive this particular osteosarcoma. So how do mutations cause cancer? Um, are you going to, well, let, let's start here. So the way a mutation causes cancer is, is as follows. So you know that the human genome is 3 billion letters long. The vast majority of these letters don't do anything, they're just junk. So about 1% of genetic code <clears throat> encodes for genes, and genes are the machines of cells. When you get a mutation in the code of the machines, that's when you can get a change in the machine that might drive cancer. Most of the time, so we all, all of our cells acquire mutations all the time, thankfully these changes do nothing. But very occasionally, this change occurs in a gene where the specific mutation causes a change in the amino acid, which then changes the working of the machinery in a way that it promotes cancer. So, and one broad category of cancer genes are so-called oncogenes. And they were, they, were, they were discovered, this is, I put this here out, this is a sort of seminal study where, um, uh, the following was found. So there is a particular particular gene. It doesn't really matter what it's called. Let's just, for the sake of it, we'll, we'll say it's named KRAS, but you don't need to remember the, the, the name. And what these guys found is that this particular gene and a particular amino acid is mutated in certain cancers. And what that does is it sends this gene into overdrive and overdriving this gene then causes cell divisions. So these are genes where you get, you make them cancerous by overactivating them. And then there's a bunch of genes which are called tumor suppressor genes. So those are called oncogenes. And then there's a bunch of tumor suppressor genes. And the first tumor suppressor gene described is this retinoblastoma gene, the RB1 gene, where what they do is they protect the cell from overcycling. So in cancers, you lose both copies of those protective genes to, to enable rapid cell division. So the big challenge, of course, is how do we find mutations? And this goes back to what I showed you that quote of Will Becker, and I've put up the Eagle Pub here. So the Eagle Pub is a pub in Cambridge. It actually is on Corpus land, and it's just opposite Corpus. And that's more where, where Watson and Crick announced the discovery of, uh, of the structure of the DNA 
which of course was the basis for the Human Genome Project. So what we needed first in order to be able to discover cancer genes and mutations, we needed to know the genetic code, and that's been cracked by the sort of early 2000s. And what happened afterwards is, is this, that um, initially the way we sequence DNA, and I'll show this here on the right, is that you take a piece of DNA and then you sequence that piece of DNA. That piece of DNA would typically be 300 bases long. So that's how the Human Genome Project was done. Now imagine 3 billion bases chopped into 300 bases little pieces. And it takes a couple of days to sequence each of those. And you have to do it 10 times over to, um, to be able to get an accurate readout. And the machine doing that is the size of a telephone box. So you can imagine that was not easy to do. So you needed an awful lot of telephone boxes, even if you could afford to have a thousand in a row, that would still take a very long time. And doing, getting that draft of the human genome took just over 10 years. It took three major institutions around the world to do it in a collaborative manner, billions of pounds, thousands of people. And then this quite wonderful thing happened which is called next generation sequencing. And that's what I've shown here you, uh, to you on the left. And that's an invention from Cambridge. And it's, it's like, you know, if you, I don't know whether you're into Star Trek, but imagine the invention of the, um, of the warp engine. This is, this is just like that. It's the invention of the warp engine for sequencing. So this telephone box, of a, of, a, of a machine has been miniaturized into a microscopic well. And then we can put on a little chip that is no bigger than a chocolate bar, we can put millions of these sequences. So the first thing that happened is that we turned the big box into something sub-microscopic. And then the next thing that happened is that we bring informatics along that can read out, can capture all the data. So we can now do the Human Genome Project that took over 10 years, we can do it in one day. And we don't just do it once over. If you look on the left here, we have covered this particular red base several times over. So we can read out an entire human genome 30, 40, 50 times in just one day, which you know in the old days would have taken five or six days. I mean, it's extraordinary uh, how, how fantastic this discovery is. And this is a machine here. So the way I think about it, it's a modern microscope. It's a microscope of DNA that allows us to, to read DNA. It's, it's called next generation sequencing or massively parallel sequencing, massively parallel because we do a reaction in parallel at a massive scale. So what we can now do is we can actually sequence tumors. So you take a bit of tumor, you take a bit of normal tissue of the same patient, compare the two and the difference between the cancer DNA changes and the normal cell, those differences are what turns the cancer, the normal cell into a cancer cell. Showing you here a picture on the, on the top left, what you can see here, this is a genetic code of BRCA2. It's one of, one of the cancer genes discovered here in Cambridge. And you can see that when you take a train from London to Cambridge, and these colors here represent the A, C, Gs, and Ts of that particular genetic code of that cancer gene. And here's a picture of the Sanger Institute, that's why I am today where we do this fancy sequencing. So now the next question is, can we use mutations to treat patients? And that's where I would like to conclude on. So remember what I told you about BCR able, so that, that, that particular mutation, which is tagging two genes together that was discovered in the 60s. And the excitement about that is that then a drug company developed a drug that only targets a mutation. That's beautiful. So you can give it to a person, an individual, a human, and it will only go and target the cancer cells. It will leave all the other cells alone. That's, of course, that is the holy grail of cancer treatment. So when we started doing this sequencing, so we compare tumors to normal, we kind of thought, well, we're going to find a holy grail for every tumor. Unfortunately, that's not true, but a few examples exist. And this, this here is one of those, um, uh, uh, one of those, examples discovered in the early 2000s by my uh, then PhD supervisors, Mark Stratton and Andy Futria. And what they found this is this, that in about 60% of melanoma, melanoma is a skin cancer, they found the same mutation in the gene called BRAF. And this particular mutation drives, is, 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 BRAF is an oncogene, so the mutation 
uh, 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 Uber drives view up. It puts it into, into you know, uh, completely crazy mutant mode, be super, super hyperactive. And that drives cancer. And metastatic melanoma, unfortunately, is a disease for which at that time there was no treatment around. So it didn't really respond to chemotherapy. It didn't really respond to radiotherapy. And you can't really go around cutting out lots and lots of metastases. And what they found, therefore, is in 60% in of patients with metastatic melanoma, they can find this one mutation. And then drug companies did what they did for BCI able They found a drug that will only target BRAF with a mutation, but leave BRAF without a mutation alone. And then, then they tested it in patients. And what I'm showing you here on the left and right is a PET scan of the same individual. The PET scan is a very particular type of scan. And what a PET scan does is it lights up all metastases in, in the body and other active organs, such as you know, the brain and the, um, the thyroid. So this is not cancer, but all the other blobs that you see are cancer. And, uh, and then this patient was given this drug and what you can see is that all the cancer blobs disappeared. So, you know, this is magic. All the other blobs that you see here are normal blobs of normal biology, normal physiology that you would expect to find. So that's, a, that's an extraordinary response. So just bear in mind, at this point, this patient's life expectancy would have been, you know, another week or two or three or four, maybe that. And then he was given this drug and it all disappeared, which is just, just fantastic. The only downside is this. It doesn't, the drug doesn't actually have many side effects. The downside is that the cancer is incredibly clever. So this drug works for several months and then the disease will come back. And the reason why the disease comes back is because the cancer cells develop a, an, another mutation that makes it independent of BRAF. So what happens is we, we sort of induce evolution in the patient. We give them a BRAF inhibitor, we treat them with the BRAF inhibitors, the cancer cells regress, and then they come back because they get another mutation that allows them to escape, that allows them to evade that drug that we are throwing at them. And uh, those particular gene mutations are typically in a gene um, that comes after BRAF in a signaling cascade called MEC. So we've now also developed MEC inhibitors, but then cancers also managed to evade that. However, so it doesn't sound all that positive anymore, but it still is, because just bear in mind that these, these poor individuals wouldn't have lived for, for any, any length of time, and at least we can buy them several months of very high quality life with these drugs. And the occasional patient does actually survive. So this is uh, still, I think, a very important uh, uh, finding and actually it makes a difference to patients' lives. Now, in the, how do we do this in the clinic? So the NHS is remarkably progressive in this regard. So I'm, as a pediatric oncologist, we will get cancer sequences back on every single patient that we look after. And we... Um, uh, so we do whole genome sequencing on every child with a tumor, and then we can look for these things that we might be able to target. And it makes a difference in about, we reckon about, we've just written a paper and about one quarter of our patient population, this whole genome sequencing data, knowing what mutations causes the cancer is helpful in, in treating the patient. So cancer is caused by mutations. And going back to what I said initially, therefore the causes of mutations are the causes of cancer. So what causes mutations? Normal physiology aging with every cell division, we acquire mutations, unhealthy life science, smoking, um, UV light exposure without sunscreen, faulty genes, and just a bit of bad luck. I'll, I'll uh, skip this. So let me summarize, therefore. So Cambridge is a great deal of fun. Um, cancer is caused by mutations. If you haven't learned anything else from today, please take this message away. And we can now easily crack the genetic code of cancers, which is sort of heralding a new era of modern oncology. And we've got about 15 minutes left. And I suggest that we, um, if you put your questions in the Q&A, we can, we can go through those. Great. Great. Thanks, Sam. Um, so I think sort of a nuts and bolts on almost to start off with, um, Hani, I wanted to know, I think, if you could just re repeat some of the names of the scientists that you were talking about at the very start. 
Uh, okay, so the, the, the chaps and the woman who discovered BCR able could, well, let's go to the German. The German is called Bovary, and I think I can put this in the chat. Let me try that. Let me see. Can you? Can they access the chat? Can they? They see should the be able. They should be able to. Okay. So number one, you really guys you really do not need to remember those names. No one would ever ever ask you about them in any kind of interview and in any other stand up life. But the German who did the sea urchin experiments is Bovary. Um, now the guys who discovered uh, BCR able are Nowell and Hungerford. They found the Philadelphia chromosome. And then the lady who actually said what I did, the BCR able lady, was called Rowley. Don't ask me what their first names are. Any any other name? If you wanted to know any other name, put it now in the Q and A or the chat. That is your last opportunity in life to figure out. <laughs> the um, okay. Oh, so, very well. All right. Next next question. Um, so. Uh, this is from Sienna. How far away do you believe we are from finding a more gentle, from, from finding more gentle cancer treatments? Okay, that, that's, a, that's a very, very good question, Sienna. So now that's an interesting thing. I actually think that, so what these drugs do, such as the BRAF inhibitor or, or also BCA, but what they do is they prevent cells from dividing, but they don't kill them. And I think this is where the issue comes from in, in using these drugs. I think ultimately, we will always also have to use drugs that kill cells. And, and therefore, I do not think that we will ever be in a position to treat someone with cancer without using nasty drugs that make the patients very poorly. My hope is that in the future, we don't have to treat cancer at all anymore and that how the way we, we approach cancer treatment in this country is moving away from treating cancer to preventing cancer. And really what I'm talking about is trying to find cancer really very early through intelligent screening programs to, to, to nip it in the bud as it before it kicks off. But unfortunately, I think even with these fancy drugs, we will always need a backbone of, of old fashioned traditional cancer killing drugs. And that's really very sad. Um, thank you. Uh, a message from uh, a question from Kai. Is there a correlation between the type of mutation and the severity of the cancer it causes? That's, that's a really interesting question. So the answer is sometimes yes and sometimes no. So I can give you an example. If you have got uh, a bulk standard leukemia and bulk standard in inverted commas, you know, nothing is standard about having a leukemia as a child, which would be a B cell leukemia. If you have a B cell leukemia, just generally speaking, we can cure about 90, 95% of children with those leukemias, which is fantastic really. Although it comes at a very high price, we treat them for a long time with you know, quite heavy, heavy, heavy guns, but actually we can cure 90, 95% of children. However, if these leukemias have got specific mutations, that cure rate can drop to as low as 30, 40%, there are some mutations that render these leukemias untreatable, and then these turn into universally fatal leukemias. That's really quite dramatic. So it's the same leukemia under the microscope. It looks the same, it's the same B cell that gave rise to that leukemia, but the presence of a specific mutation turns something that is curable into something that is universally fatal. Um, and it sort of, a, I think, a related, well, to my mind, a related question, even though I am just a historian. Um, a question from um, Jay. How does a drug actually work that targets a specific mutated gene? What is it actually doing in the body? Okay. So if you think about BCR able, for example, so it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a receptor tyrosine kinase with a mutation. So something that sits on the cell surface. And the way it works, these are switches, these are on and off switches. And basically through the mutation, it's turned on all the time. What the drug does is it binds to the receptor, so it can't, it sort of blocks the switch. I mean, if you literally think of it as a switch, you can't, you can't physically, mechanically push it anymore because there's something stuck to it. And that's the principle how most of these kinase inhibitors work, the same is true for BRAF. You get the drug, it just gets into a specific fold within BRAF, and then that BRAF, if it has a mutation, 
it get this shape of BRAF changes. So it only gets into BRAFs with a funny shape and then it'll sit there and then the, the switch can't function anymore. Okay. Um, so uh, this is from Mohammed. Uh, do you believe that CRISPR can be used against and maybe even to fix mutations? Uh, CRISPR? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So um, that's a very interesting question. So really what you're asking is, can we use gene editing to reverse cancer? So could we introduce little nanobots into a body that go and find sort of mutated things and then, then try to correct them. Um, so the challenge will be to get the specificity here. So basically what you're saying is we need to find a way of gene editing that will only be active in cells that carry mutations. So basically you need to have such sophisticated gene editing machineries that allow you to specifically only target mutant reads. That's not inconceivable. But this uh, right now, today, on the 21st of March 2022, CRISPR isn't that specific yet. Although it's quite specific, it's actually not that specific. But it's uh, certainly an interesting thought. I don't know whether, you know, realistically in my lifetime I will see that, but it's not inconceivable. It's certainly a very interesting idea. Um, and this is a, a question from uh, Chasman. Um, it seems that cancer is constantly one st step ahead of the scientists. Do you ever feel like you are working towards something impossible? Um, and also, how do you keep going, if that's true? So I don't think that I'm, I'm working on something impossible. I sort of think that um, uh, what happens is cancers do things in very predictable ways. So the thing about melanoma, the second, the next mutation after the BRAF inhibitor, the next mutation, tends to be always the same. So we are, we are beginning to learn how cancer evades our strategies. And therefore, if we understand those, those pathways, then we can be one step ahead, actually. But the way I keep going is, is as follows. Um, we cure 85% of children under our care. So that's, that's very good. The 15% that we don't cure, they are their soul destroying and, and devastating. But at the end of the day, um, you know, we all choose a specialty. When you, when you choose your specialty, you need to be very careful about how can I live with the worst aspect of, of, your, of my specialty? And for me, of course, the worst aspect of my specialty, well, there are two things. There's the suffering that we cause for our treatments, which is very unbearable. It's really, it's so upsetting to see uh, when, we, when, when children um, uh, get very sick from chemotherapy. So that's one bit, but I can sort of live with that because I know they're going to get better and we will cure them in most cases. But then the other thing is children dying and children dying is something that is very difficult to um, get used to. And actually, I think no one should ever get used to it. So the day that I don't get upset anymore by my children dying, by my patients, I think that's the day when I went all to give up clinical work. It's profoundly upsetting, <clears throat> but you know, I, I have to cope with it. I've chosen the specialty. And if I can't cope with this, I should have gone into a different specialty. But that raises a very important point, you know, get into medical school, you go through your training, you make choices, just make sure that you can live with the worst aspect of your specialty. Mm. Very, very, yeah, very true. Um, this is a question from uh, Qi Ying. Um, between chemotherapy and monoclonal antibodies, um, which do you think is a superior treatment? Um, as, I, as I said, I think they, they, they work hand in hand. You can't cure a patient with um, monoclonal antibodies alone. You can actually cure a patient with chemotherapy on, on their own. And if you want, ideally you find ways of getting maximum benefits from, the both, uh, from both together. So a very good example are group of diseases called high-grade B-cell lymphomas. So they're lymphomas, lumps of lymph glands that are caused by aberrant B-cells, which is why it's called a B-cell lymphoma. And high-grade means they're rapidly dividing rather than low, uh, slowly dividing. And these high-grade B-cell lymphomas, traditionally we have been able to cure in probably 80% of children with chemotherapy, 80, 85% actually, with just quite, 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 intense but very highly effective chemotherapy so very good treatment really and then there is an antibody uh, which is called rituximab which targets b cells specifically it targets something called cd20 
So we started using it to see there was a big trial to see whether that makes a difference. We didn't really think it would make a difference because 85% is pretty good, but actually with the addition of this antibody, you can now cure up to 95, 98% of children. So that's extraordinary. With the antibody alone, you wouldn't cure anybody. So it's uh, they, they, they go together, but there is one example, is a very successful example of, of an antibody having made a dramatic difference in addition to convention, conventional cell killing chemotherapy. Mm. Um, this is from Amelia. Um, why is leukemia more common in childhood cases? Is it something to do with the child's uh, uh, physiology or just bad luck? So overall cancer is very, very rare in children. If you look at what cancers do children get and what cancers do adults get, there's a huge difference. The difference is not explained by leukemia being more common in children than in adults. It is explained by all the other cancers being more common in adults. And the reason why all the other cancers are more common is because what adults get are epithelial cancers. So in the epithelium is a, <clears throat> the cell type that interacts with the outer world. So old people get lung cancer when they smoke because that's where the epithelium gets damaged by cigarette smoke. We get skin cancer from UV light because that's where our epithelium in, gets damaged by UV light. We get colorectal cancer because the colorectal epithelium gets damaged by unhealthy food and, and, the, and the passage of, of, of feces. We get breast cancer, prostate cancer because those epithelial cells under the influence of hormones wax and wane and acquire mutations. So it's a preponderance of epithelial cancers in adults that makes leukemia relatively rare in adults and more common in children. Amongst children, leukemia is the most common cancer, probably, and, and you know why all the, probably again, because all the other cancers are incredibly rare, you just have to be so unlucky as a child to get the wrong mutation and the wrong gene at the wrong time to then get a cancer. Thank you. Um, oh, sorry, I lost my track and where I was looking. Um, so uh, this is from um, Asian. Um, if someone has a family history of cancer, will that mean that person themselves has a higher chance of getting that specific mutation? Uh, no, not at all. So with a little caveat, one, one in three people will get cancer and they will get cancer because they're old and they've been exposed to cancer, to mutation causing to mutagens in the environment. So that's that. There are, however, certain cancers that are unusual and, and indicate that there might be a germline mutation. So mutation running in, the con in, in every cell that runs in the family that under pinset cancer. So, uh, you know, a very, very uh, popular example, I guess, will be, will be the BRCA2 gene and Angelina Jolie who got, uh, um, who got her breasts removed and her ovaries removed because she has got this mutation in that particular gene which runs in her family and she knew it ran in her family because her female family members got cancer, breast cancer very early in life. So she was screened for it. And therefore then she went on and had this, this preventive measure. So the answer is that most, most cancers arise out of nowhere. In very, very rare cases, is it, is it a problem with the germline and that runs in family? And the way that becomes apparent is by being odd cancers or typical cancers in very young people. Um, here's a question from Rosie. Um, is there a way to uh, develop a drug that is alive in the sense that it mutates along with the cancer so that the cancer is always being inhibited regardless of its future mutations? That's an interesting question that I haven't thought about. I don't know. I mean, that's a very interesting question to consider. Okay. Rosie gets the gold star then for, would, for, for stumping you. I would agree with that. Okay. Um, and then um, how viable is it to use personalized um, cancer treatment to treat specific cancers in terms of efficacy and cost? Um, thankfully, I'm a pediatric oncologist. So I'm, I'm not really bothered by costs. There's so few children, thankfully, who've got cancer in the country and no no NHS manager has ever told me you can't, you know, you can't do this or you can't do that. So I think cost for me is irrelevant, irrelevant but of course, so that, you know, if you think about everybody in the country, then it's no longer uh, relevant. I 
think that the answer to your question is we already personalize care because you know, although I use the same chemotherapy schedule for every child, I would tailor it to individual children and what the specific situation is. And then we tag on these fancy drugs if and where we can. And I guess as a society, we need to make a choice there. there what is What do we think is, is good value for money? And um, for this primarily, this is where things like mice come into play. They do these, these complicated calculations and tell you, get that many quality years of life for, for that particular drug and so forth. But really, I think, uh, I, I personally think it's unacceptable not to not to be funding these drugs when, when we can use them, whether it's a child or, or a very old person, they both have a, have a right to, to live longer if it's achievable for a drug. Um, this is from Nearbay. Um, should the NHS conduct nationwide screening for all types of cancer in order to catch cancer early? I think so. And I mean, we just need to be intelligent and how, about how we do it. So we start doing a little bit. So there's like, I think when you turn 60 or 65, you get a one of ultrasound of your kidneys because most people who have a kidney tumor will have it then. And if you get it later in life, it doesn't matter anymore anyway, because they're quite slowly growing. So you would never, you would never um, uh, 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 have a problem with it. And same for prostate cancer, you can screen for it and then uh, with, with an easy blood test. So yeah, absolutely. I think it's about intelligent screening. Um, and uh, for, we, I know we're jumping around topics a little bit, Sam, but uh, do you think that we will ever be able to synthesize a substitute for bone marrow transplant, transplant in order to cut the time spent looking for perfect matches? Um, well, that's another interesting question. Um, Maybe, uh, to be quite honest, from my own experience, finding a, um, a, a match isn't all that tricky. The challenge in, in bone marrow transplantation is not finding the match. The challenge in bone marrow transplantation is to do the transplant because uh, the, the chemotherapy that we give is extremely intense and it takes children and adults a, a great deal of time to recover from that. And it's really dangerous stuff. It's, it's, uh, it's almost as dangerous as the, the, the brain surgery that uh, uh, Mr. Ioannidis performs. Great. Um, have, have we got time for a few more, Sam? Just there's a lot of unanswered questions. Is that okay? I'm conscious. No, no, let's do another two or three and then. Okay. Um, I, um, my colleagues. Um, so here's what I mean, this is just interesting to me. Um, what do you think is the likelihood of bringing venom based treatment? Um, into the treatment of cancer? So for example, bee venom in the treatment of prostate cancer? I have no idea. I've never heard it, but it sounds very interesting and, and I shall certainly Google it at some point. Okay, so that chap gets a gold star as well yeah. um, for stumping you. Um, and then, emotionally though, no gold awards here. <laughs> um, there's also been quite a few questions um, about when you talked about how um, the cancer can mutate so much that it becomes untreatable, and quite a few questions. I mean, could you just go into that in a little bit more depth in a short space of time? Okay, so cancers mutate in. It's, it's a bit more complicated than that. So. Remember that that patient with the uh, with with, melasno, uh, with metastatic melanoma had the black spots everywhere. So we, we give a BRAF inhibitor, and what happens? It, it it regresses, and then it comes back, and it comes back because it's got another mutation that allows it to evade it. Now, what turns out is so we initially we thought what happens is okay, the mutation develops after we give the treatment, but that's not true actually. The mutation was there already, so of let's say 10 million cancer cells, 9,999,999 cells did not have that second mutation, but one did, but it was a tiny little cell that we can't detect, but we can actually we do fancy sequencing, which is why we knew it was there. We then give the BRAF inhibitor, so all the cells that haven't got that mutation die, except for that one cell, which has got that second mutation, and that then gets an advantage over all the other cells and starts are growing, and this is how it works. It's a bit like if you think about a bacterial culture and you give antibiotics and you get antibiotic resistance because one cell there has got a way of doing that. That's it's not that dissimilar, but the key thing is it's already pre-existing, and that makes the task so so very difficult. Hmm. Okay, and then I think one more um, and a slightly uh, easier question, possibly. Um, uh, why did you choose uh, pediatric oncology as opposed to oncology in general? 
So I'm, 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 I'm one of those cliches. I think I was born with a pediatric stethoscope. So I always knew I wanted to be a pediatrician. So the other thing to say is that when I was a medical student, I absolutely hated cancer biology and I really hated genetics. So those were the two topics that I was quite allergic to, to a degree. I mean, I tried to avoid them at all costs at every stage. And I did my, my third year in classical sort of bicycle physiology, breathing and, and heart physiology and that sort of thing. It was only when I went to clinical school that I thought the patients that I enjoy speaking the most were the patients with cancer for one reason or the other. I found it, you know, that, that really uh, uh, caught my interest and, and it was always very uh, instructive on so many different levels. Now, I really do not like adult medicine for a whole lot of reasons that I won't recite here. So it was then the logical thing for me to do to do pediatric oncology. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Sam. Really appreciate that. And I'm sorry, everyone, that there's now 89 unanswered questions. Um, we'll have to get Sam back for a for an overflow question at some some point in the future. But yeah, apologies if I didn't get around to um, putting your question forward to Sam. Um, so I'll just say on behalf of everyone who's attended, thank you very much for your talk and your thank patience you. in answering all the questions. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Thanks a lot. Bye bye.